When you hear the word finance, how do you react? If you're like most people, the thought of having to look at or deal with your numbers brings fear or dread because it's a topic that's often seen as scary, confusing, confronting, or just plain boring as batshit. But here's the thing. Finance doesn't have to be overwhelming or intimidating, and it can actually be super fun and even stimulating because making money, becoming more successful, and creating more wealth is vital if you want to build a thriving and sustainable business or provide a strong financial foundation for your family. I created Financial Foreplay to demystify finance, and I've been using my proprietary methodology and strategies based on science for over a decade to make complex financial concepts accessible to everyone. I want to give you the knowledge you need in order to become even more successful at growing your business or building real wealth by introducing you to global experts so that you can learn from the best. And you're going to meet some trailblazing entrepreneurs because I want you to be inspired by their stories, challenges, and triumphs. Financial foreplay is a registered trademark, which is why there is only one financial foreplay. It's time to slip into something a little bit more comfortable because we're about to dive in and begin. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Financial Foreplay. Today's episode is called Getting to First Base, Why Profit's a Vanity Metric and Cash is Vital. So how I want to frame this up is by talking first about why I called it Getting to First Base. And now, I'm, I'm guessing that some of you have and some of you have not watched the movie Moneyball. So I want to frame it up by just telling you a little bit about that movie, because that's where this title came from. Now, the movie Moneyball was it's kind of a, an unlikely source for great business advice, really, for entrepreneurs or for just laypersons in general. But it's a real life story about a guy named Billy Bean, who is the general manager of a major league baseball team that was at the bottom of the ladder the Oakland A's. They were kind of crushed by the big budgets and and all the big name players of teams like the New York Yankees and the Cleveland Indians. Basically, Billy Bean is forced to take a risk and he has to do something that no team has ever done before. And it's to completely abandon all the traditional recruiting methods that people have done for decades. And he employed a computer generated analysis a mathematical model to acquire and trade players, right? So they didn't have money to attract these big MVPs who could basically hit the big home runs. So they basically had to create this mathematical model to identify players who could consistently hit the ball and get to first base. So in in doing this, it's really, really fascinating because Billy Bean basically changed the face and the landscape of the game of baseball in America forever. And one of the things I really liked about the movie, and it's a perfect way to introduce who our speaker is today, it came out of one of what I think is one of the most famous quotes in the movie. And what he said was, you're not solving the problem. You're not even looking at the problem. Now, what does this mean? it's It's very easy for all of us to get distracted by issues and rhetoric swirling around the actual problem that we have. And that can be a problem that we have in our personal budgeting and finances or even with our business. The more you or others have personally invested in the status quo, the way that things have always been done, the more that you're going to be prevented from actually seeing what the real problem is or seeing it for what it is. You need to seek advice and perspective sometimes from people who are outside your industry. Because those of us who are inside, those of us who are inside our family dynamic, those of us who are inside our small business are going to be emotionally attached to the way that things have always been done. And thus we have started to become part of the problem ourselves. Which brings me to why I've invited my very good friend, Dr. Reginald Thomas Lee, to this program today. Reginald is a doctor. He's an educator. He's an author, an international and Um, TEDx speaker. He's a corporate advisor in the areas of generating and managing cash and capacity management. Now, he's already authored four books, including two of my favorites, Lies, Damn Lies, and Cost Accounting, and Strategic Cost Transformation. 
And I understand, and I'm sure he'll talk about it a little bit um, later in, in this podcast, he's got a couple of more of these great books under contract right now. He's advised some really major companies, including Bristol, Meyer Squibb, Dell, Disney, DuPont, Lockheed Martin, and Toyota. You know, Reginald, he's a professor of both engineering and business and currently teaches in business analytics department at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Reginald has a PhD in mechanical engineering. He's not an accountant, which means he's outside of the financial industry. Um, he's got that from the University of Dayton. It makes him just, not only is he a great guy and a wonderful, wonderful speaker, Reginald is really smart and he's got some great ideas that I think are going to be really helpful to you in building um, more successful finances for your family, but also for your business. So um, thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show. And I'm really excited to hear your voice and talk to you today, Reginald. Thank you, Rhonda Lynn. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate you uh, bringing me on the show to talk about some exciting topics. Yeah, look, we always have a great conversation, you and I, so I think we should probably get stuck right into it and Absolutely. start to um, show our listeners some really great value right from the beginning. Sure. Um, can you explain in a nutshell why you think that businesses shouldn't focus on profit? Because I think most people think that they, you know, they write, they print their P&L out and they look and see how much profit they have. And that's somehow some kind of indication of how great their business is doing. Yeah. Well, it's it's really a controversial topic. And it's kind of like when you go back to Moneyball, some of the metrics that they use, you know, they talked about the importance of getting on first base. Sometimes you hit, sometimes you walk. But it's understanding that that's the objective is to get on base, as you talked about. When I look at businesses, especially small businesses, their objective, their goal is to generate cash. And so what we need is to make sure that we do a holistic analysis of our ways to understand cash. And generally what we'll do is we will look at, as you mentioned, your P&L and based on my calculated profit, then I'll think that I'm doing well or I'm not. But there are a number of issues associated with this, right? When I look at cash, right, cash is a very simple idea. Cash is how much money I have now. And then if I look at an analysis period, let's say a month, how much came in and how much left. And so it's really a simple idea, right, of looking at how cash flows into the organization, how, how it flows out. Why does cash flow into an organization? Why does it flow out? Okay. And so when you start thinking about it, you know, an example I like to give is I'm a, a professor, right? So I wake up and I don't have any money. I got $20 U.S., so then I give 10 to the kids, I go in, I eat for $5, I'm down to five. And then the university pays me $10 at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, I'm looking at $15. So what's key there is what did I start with, what came in, what went out, and what the period is, okay? So one of the first problems that we have with accounting and profit is that it doesn't follow the rules of cash. For example, I can sell someone something today and say, hey, you know what? December's almost over, pay me in January, okay? And I could have, if it's retail, I could have purchased whatever it is that I sold this person in November. So I purchased it and paid for it in November. Or I actually manufactured it, let's say in November or October, right? So the money that's coming in from the sale won't happen until next month. The money I spent on the item was spent in a previous month. So how can I calculate cash in this month? But I can calculate profit, right? Because I can recognize that revenue and say, hey, I sold this item. Now it doesn't look for whether I spent money or not. So that's, that's problem number one is that accounting profit doesn't model the dynamics of cash. So it, it can't be cash. The second problem is this. When you start thinking about how we came up with the cost of the item in the first place, right? We came up with some kind of a way to determine that the widget that we produce and sell costs us $5. The problem with that is that when you start thinking about calculating that cost, there are so many different ways of doing it. And because there are so many ways of doing it, the different ways are going to calculate different costs. So if I, if I calculate the cost one way, it's going to be $5. But if I calculate it using a different approach or different assumptions, it could be $4.50. Or it could be $5.50. So I don't really know what this number is. Number one. Number two, 
it, if every time I make an item, I'm not spending $5 to make that item and I'm not saving $5 if I don't make that item. So there's no cash transaction that's involved. And then this number can change based on how we choose to cost it. So if it can change based on ideas or assumptions, and if, it's, if there's no cash transaction, then you got to ask the question, or are the product costs themselves even cash? And so if the product cost itself is not cash, because remember, it's determined by how we choose, you know, what assumptions we make, what models we choose to use, right? That's going to determine the cost and there's no cash transaction. So when I tie all this stuff together, then that tells me that my gross margin is taking revenue, which I hope is going to be cash. and I'm subtracting a non-cash value from it. And so, you know, we learned in second grade, you can't subtract apples and oranges, but that's exactly what we're doing when we start off the first couple of lines of the income statement is taking revenue, which we assume to be cash. But that cost of goods sold, the cost of sales is not a cash transaction. It's not a cash number. So all, right off the bat, the, the math is off. And what I what I see as a result, Rondalyn, is a lot of people make some really bad decisions and that those are decisions that keep them from making more money. And so what I suggest is that companies, instead of focusing on accounting profit, should instead focus on cash. What am I doing to generate cash? What am I doing that's causing me to spend cash? And when I start thinking about cash, the nature of the decisions that we make as business owners is going to be very different. One of the examples that I really loved from your book, Strategic Cost Accounting, is where you explain to folks why this notion of non-cash versus, you know, real cash exists and how um, when you've got a, a number, let's just say that you think that it costs you $5.10 per unit, that um, if they sell the unit, they don't pay somebody $5.10 necessarily. And that's in the case of when, you know, you're not necessarily buying shoes and then selling shoes, that there may be some components of um, human labor or service that are rolled up into that cost calculation. And the other aspect of it is where you talk about when you don't sell the product or the service, you don't necessarily save dollars and five you know, $5.10. Can you walk the listeners through that? Because I think it's really important. Sure, sure. So I'll shift a little bit, if you don't mind, to see if I can begin explaining why um, there's a difference between cash costs and non-cash costs, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I put a box around a company, and when that company buys something and pays for it, it has to pay from its coffers, right? It's got to pay cash for it. So generally, when we look at cash, cash leaves the company because we bought something and we've got to pay for it. Right. So the first issue associated with calculating these costs is this. When you look at labor. Right. So let's say you do make products that you sell. And so I've got laborers, as you suggested, making these widgets. So if I don't pay the laborer based on piecework, so every unit that they make, I pay them a certain amount. I pay you a dollar for every hat that you make, for example. If I don't have a situation like that and instead I'm buying time, then when I look at how the cash transactions are associated with labor, I buy the time. So if I pay them $30 for an hour, I pay them $30 whether they are producing items or they're not producing items, right? They get that $30 regardless. The problem is when we try to determine the cost of what it is that they create. And this creates a mathematical problem. And the way I describe the mathematical problem to folks is basically with this example. We have the old landlines, right? And so we pay $25 and we have access to local phone calls. And so for $25 for a month, I can make as many local phone calls as I want. But the phone service is going to charge us 10 cents a minute for long distance. So I know that if I spend 10 minutes on a long distance call, it's going to cost me a dollar. There's a cash transaction associated with being on the call for a dollar. I mean, for 10 minutes, right? However, if you ask, what does a local call cost? Then people start scratching their heads. And they scratch their heads because there's no easy way to do it, right? There are a lot of ways I can figure it out. I can take the total number of minutes I was on a phone, for example, and divide it into 25. You know, I can take the number of, of days, hours in a day I should be on the phone and come up with an hourly minute or hourly or minute, right? I can come up with all these things. But I've got to come up with all these things because there's no relationship between what I bought, which is time, and how I use it, which is creating output. And so proof of that is if you take a look at any of us who have salaries in our organization, right, we get paid 
whether we have a good day or a bad day. And it's the same, right? Generally, we don't get paid differently if we're more, uh, you know, more or less productive. So our salaries are tied to time. And so because these things are independent, for me to calculate a cost, I have to create a relationship between the two of them, right? That's when I, when I take the $25 and I divide it by the number of working days in a week and working minutes in a day, right? That's creating a relationship between what I bought, access $25, and how I use it, making phone calls. And so mathematically, that creates a problem because I can't create a relationship between these two things. And so in well, you doing can, so- you can, but You can, but it's not accurate. You can't. Right? No, you yeah. can't. Mathematically, you can't. Because what you're no. doing is you're creating a relationship between two independent people and two independent things. So, for example, as I sit in my office at the university, I can create a relationship between the number of electronic devices in my office and the number of pickup trucks that drive by during this interview. I can create that relationship. But the question yeah, it is, just doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Right. Because if I if someone brings in a new iPhone, does that mean that four more trucks are going to pop up and drive by? And the answer is no. And it's because there is no relationship between the two. And so it's hard for us to wrap our, our, our head around this one because we've been told for so long that there is a relationship be, between what we buy and how we use it, but there really isn't. And so a follow-on example I like to use is my daughter Isabella likes to bake, right? So let's say that we buy a 10-pound bag of flour for $10. And if she uses one pound of that flour, we want to say that it cost her a dollar to use that flower, right? But going back to your point, there was no transaction there of paying a dollar to use it. The only transaction was paying the $10 to buy the flower, right? So if we assume that every pound is worth a dollar and Isabella makes cookies, she sells them to her friend, what if she throws away the rest of that bag? Now, is that one pound still only worth a dollar? Is that one pound now worth $10? And so when we've got to calculate these costs, what's happening, Rhonda Lynn, is that we're creating a relationship between two independent things. And when I create that relationship, then the values that come out of it are based, are mathematically nonsense. And so when you talk about getting outside of accounting, as an engineer, when I start looking, started looking at the math of, of accounting 20 some years ago, I started realizing this makes no sense. This makes, makes no mathematical sense. Very, very fundamental math rules are being broken when we start calculating these costs. And so that's why when I go to companies, the, the focus is, you know, I'll talk to the CEO and CFO and I'll say, do you guys want to focus on profit or do you want to focus on making money? Because we can improve your profitability simply by going and changing how you cost your products and services without doing a thing. And then as we change how you cost your products and services, it's going to reflect a larger profit with nothing being done, Right. We can do the same for the opposite, where we can increase your costs so that we can have a lower tax base. We can play around with these numbers without doing anything. But for cash, I'm going to have to make changes. I'm going to have to make changes to the rate at which cash comes in, why it came in. I sold more stuff so now I can generate more cash, for instance. Or when you start taking a look at things such as spending money, right? When, one of the things I've talked about with companies coming out of COVID is if you're focused on your product margin, you're probably going to make stupid decisions regarding your capacity. For example, if I'm focusing on getting people to, to produce things efficiently, then what I may do is start focusing on building more product, even then there's demand for it. So I get my efficiencies down, my costs look, be- look better, but then what, what's happened? I probably spent more revenue, I mean, uh, more, more cash on buying materials, for example, or maybe um, you know, things to help my machines run faster. I mean, I spent more money just to get this fictitious number down. And so what I tell people is that cash doesn't really lie. It, 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 you know, either it comes in, either you have it or you don't, either it comes in or it doesn't, or it leaves or it doesn't. And so if we can focus on managing those three elements of our business, then we're going to be in a much better position to be able to make these decisions. And I think the most important point that you made is that, you know, cash doesn't lie. And this is the thing. We're coming out of, hopefully, COVID at this point. But let's think about this. If we go back, how many businesses or people out there would have been making decisions about efficiency instead of thinking about, you know, what are my business cash requirements for the month in my business? And how do I get in enough cash to cover the amount that's going out? I don't think many would have actually taken the step back. A lot of them would have been focusing on all of these, you know, accounting issues rather than just saying, okay, 
$10 is leaving my business every single month. And I need to make sure that at least $10 plus a bit more is coming in so that we stay afloat. You know, you brought up a, a very important number or value, and that's business cash requirements. And when we go in to look at companies, so with my firm, um, basically the value proposition is we'll make you more cash or you don't pay, right? We will return your fees. And so all of, all of our fees are at risk and focus on generating cash. And so the easiest way that we, we do that is by looking at business cash requirements. So for a lot of, lot of companies, especially small businesses, don't think this way. The, you know, the, the, the owners aren't necessarily accountants. So either they rely on accountants, right, or they rely on their CFO. And so they're looking at these numbers, but they're not necessarily numbers folks themselves, right? So when I go into small businesses, I just ask them information about how much money are they spending to be in business? So I was, there was a um, a publishing company and I got a call. And so I went in and I was asking them, you know, so help me understand why we're in this position. They were, you know, months away from closing. And I started asking them about their business cash requirements. How much money is leaving as a result of being in business? And they couldn't tell me. They couldn't tell me. So we did an analysis, Rondalyn, and we found out that for the pre- previous 18 months, they were cash positive in five of those months and four of them because they hit their line of credit. So when we model cash and we look specifically at cash, we know what's coming in, what's going out and why. And then we can start putting that together. So what we found was that although every single book that they sold was profitable, they were losing money. And part of that was because when you look at their business cash requirements, they were, let's say, a million dollars a month. They were generating in sales 600000 in cash per month. So when you lay it out like that in clear black and white terms, then the COO, who's a CPA, and the CFO, who's a CPA, looked at me with big eyes and said, that's your problem right there. We're spending more money than we're generating cash to, gen- to bring in. And so we started looking at things such as why are they spending money at the rates that they're spending and why are they not generating cash at the rate that they're spending to offset that? And once you make that picture clear, then it, then the urgency pops up. It's, you know, the concern of, oh my God, we've got a $400,000 per month deficit. What do we do about it? When I'm looking at profitability, you know, there are certain things about the profitability that they were really missing from a cash perspective. For instance, you probably saw this in the book. I think it was an example. Um, we looked at, at, at printing, right? We said, uh, you know, you guys are using this old, this old printing technology. Why do you use it? You should probably go with digital. And their response was, well, we're more profitable with this older technology. We're making more money. And so we challenged them. We said, okay, so 10,000 books, you pay the printer $10,000, right? Yep. So a dollar a book. Yeah. Okay. So with this other technology, what would it cost to make, let's say, 5,000 books or to buy 5,000 books? And they said $8,000. So it's going to cost us $1.60 a book, right? So it's, we make more money on a book going with a lower printer. We said, yeah, but here's the problem. When you look at the average number of sales per SKU, you only sell 5,000. So if you're only selling 5,000, would you rather pay $10,000? for books to sell 5,000, or would you rather pay $8,000 for books to sell 5,000? It's less profitable to go with the 8,000, but from a cash perspective, I'm spending less money to meet the demand. And so these are the kinds of things that you can see, such, just like with the analytics and, and um, Moneyball, right? These are things that you can see that if you're not looking at them, they don't exist. But when you're looking at them, they give you another alternative to deal with the things that you're trying to deal with on a regular basis. When you start thinking about, for instance, taking on extra work, do you have the capacity to be able to deliver it? Or will you have to buy extra capacity to meet that demand? That decision itself is not often taken into the calculus. And when you do, you realize, oh, my God, now payroll is going to hit on the 15th and I've got this extra money, right? Or if an order comes in and it's an expedited order and all you're worried about or let's say negative variances. Yeah, we're going to have to run a little bit over time, but that's okay. You know, we'll, we'll still be able to get the job and, and make the client happy, right? Yeah, but what we don't see is that we got a $50,000 hit on payroll coming in two months, I mean, two weeks, because we took on this other work. And so profit doesn't tell us these things. But with cash, it becomes very, very clear of the things we have to steer clear of. And business cash requirements becomes a very fundamental metric that we use to understand the performance of a business. 
And I see this sort of discussion happening on social media quite a bit. People talking about, well, I can't afford to sell these products or to sell these services to so-and-so right now because it's not profitable. But yet they're making that decision and shooting themselves in the foot because they actually need the money, regardless of whether it's profitable or not, to meet their monthly business cash requirements because we're in a pandemic. You know, we need to start thinking about cash. You're absolutely right. And I think that this is, again, your intro was, was spot on with this. When you're, when you're focused on what you know and what you understand and you've got a vested interest in that, there's not a lot of interest in changing, right? When you're looking at something like this, what we're looking at are the things that affect how we make money. So who do you bring in, for example? A decision as simple as that. You've got an admin. Do you bring the admin in? Well, if I bring the admin in, my business cash requirements are going to jump. So what do I expect my admin to do? What is he going to do to help us generate cash? If not, maybe what we need to do is hold off on that, for instance, right? But if people are thinking only about their accounting profitability, then they'll make decisions like this printing firm. Every Again, everything that they sold was profitable, but they weren't generating any cash. And so as organizations are focused on things such as, you know, if I've got people sitting around not doing anything, if if I've got materials and equipment sitting around and not doing anything, How much money in cash am I going to spend if I take on this job? In most cases, it's going to be negligible, right, from a cash perspective. So like you said, even if the job itself may be unprofitable, it's quite likely I'm going to be able to generate cash from it. And so the cash is is generally where, where we got to get people focused, because if I'm paying the people to be there anyway and they're not doing any work, heck, bring the work in. Let's do it. Let's generate because that cash we bring in from doing the work is more than we would have had otherwise. And I see so many companies, Rhonda Lynn, who are who go down that path, right? I can't do this because it's not profitable. Well, from a, a, an accounting perspective, it's not profitable. But from a cash perspective, it is. And that's why I think it's important to talk to that COO, CEO, CEO COFO about whether they're p- focused on profit or cash, because we have to have something that trumps the other. And in most cases, what I pr- try to pr- project or suggest is that the cash itself should trump the um, the accounting numbers because I can do all kinds of things the accounting numbers not improve the business but if I want to improve the business I've got to make decisions go ahead I'm sorry no I think well what's really important is we have to remember that this whole notion of profit was created as something that we report on to figure out how much money we owe the tax office yep. it has nothing to do with the health of your business you could be the most profitable firm in the world and still have zero cash flow and be going under and, you know, paying taxes to uh, your tax collection agency. So we need to start thinking about what what kind of questions do we need to be asking around what we're spending our capacity on. And if your firm is stressed because you're in a pandemic and maybe your numbers aren't as good as you'd like them to be, we need to be asking questions about how do we bring revenue forward? How do we find new channels to market for the products that we and services that we already have? Or how do we actually find new things to sell or do with the capacity that we have in our firms so that we can just bring cash in to keep the company afloat? And I think that's kind of what you're saying in a nutshell, really. That's exactly what I'm saying. You don't need me. <laughs> <laughs> I always, uh, we always need you. Look, the stuff that the original thought that you have brought to this whole perspective, because let's be honest, um, this is quite a new and challenging perspective for a lot of people. This isn't something that's been around for a long time. Um, Most people have been talking about cost accounting and focusing on profit for decades. And so this is really, um, it's going to be confronting and a bit controversial for a lot of people to wrap their heads around this concept that what they've been measuring is actually completely useless to them. It's. Do you remember in the movie where he's, I think, I think it was Billy Bean that said, your goal shouldn't be to buy players. Your goal should be to buy wins. Right. You're focusing on the wrong thing. You know, you're, you're spending right. all the time measuring things that are irrelevant, you know, focusing on things that aren't going to keep your company afloat. And unfortunately, with COVID has kind of stripped a lot of companies bare, right? It's put them in a position where they can't fluff around anymore. You know, if you've lost a significant amount of revenue due to what happened in the pandemic, I mean, not all not all businesses are doing worse than they were before, but there is still quite a few that were locked down for long periods of time. They still have to pay the rent. 
That is a fixed cost, a business cash requirement every single month, regardless of whether you're open or you're not. And and probably the full-time employees that you have to keep on. If you can't let them go for whatever reason, you got to pay for them. And it's about, you know, do we have to stop? You know, one of my favorite examples was a company that was um, making gin, started making um, hand sanitizer instead because, you know, they wanted to contribute and make sure that they had full employment of all their capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when people see that it's good. And there are times when it's not so good, depending on the perspective. And here's an example, personal example, right? So at the universities, we're in that exact same situation, right? Where we had to shut down back in March. And so when you start thinking about where a lot of universities make their money, it's food, housing, and there's no longer that money coming in, right? So when you see that, although it's great for managing the business, sometimes for individuals, because, you know, honestly, we had to to let some people go. And that's the downside of it. But sometimes, you know, the downsides will be more than offset by being able to keep everyone else employed. And I'll give you an example. That publisher that I was talking about, right, They, the COO really did not want to get rid of folks. But we realized that there was a point where either we have to get rid of folks, which wasn't good for them, right, for the individuals, but either we have to get rid of folks or we're going to go out of business. And when you're when you're looking at that, when you see the end of the runway, then it puts you as a leader in a position to make these decisions, right? Do I buy that piece of equipment for that for our company? Do I need to buy a new computer right now? Oh, well, you know, the price per unit on on this material I'm buying is much much uh, lower if I buy three times as much as I need. Well, yeah, <laughs> when I do that, what's going to happen for my ca- from a cash perspective? Got cash going out that if you don't have the money to cover it, then what do you have to do? You have to lease it. Um, you know, get worse terms with your um with your supplier who's who's financing. I mean, all these negatives can come from that. It doesn't. Plus, you get a bunch of stuff sitting on a shelf. It isn't selling, and it isn't getting fresher either, right? Right, exactly. You know, we have to start thinking of our inventory being like lettuce sitting on a shelf, right? Lettuce has an expiry date. A lot of people think that you know, just because it's a pair of shoes or it's something that it's going to retain its value and you can eventually sell it. Well, that's not necessarily the case. It's not, especially when you think about retail, right? Because everything's got its product life cycle. And so there's certain things that when I know new ones are going to be coming out, then I don't want to spend extra cash buying stuff that's going to sit there on, on the um, on the shelf, right? So we had an issue with that with a major retailer where supply chain wanted to get rid of the stuff because they realized we spent the cash on it. It's not generating cash. But then merchandising and marketing were all me- measured based on the gross margin. So they wanted to keep the prices high. So I get the next version of a, of a printer coming out. Now I want to sell both of them at the same price. Like it's not going to work, right? Even something like a printer is going to have a shelf life because other things will bring it in and shorten that self- shelf life. And so we got to be cognizant of all these things. So if you wanted to give our listeners what you think are your kind of top two or three tips to really um, shifting their focus and measuring what really matters, what would you say to them? I would say begin by focusing and understanding what's most important to your business. And that's cash. Like Goldratt said in his book, The Goal, the goal of any company should be to generate cash. Yeah, I want to create great products. I want to be sustainable. I want to give back. That's great, but I can't do that without cash, right? So the first thing is to focus on understanding that the objective is to fo- to, to generate cash. Then the second thing I would do is I would take a long, hard look at whether the tools that I use are telling me the information that I need. So can I look at the account, the data on my, on my, um, on my dashboard right now? And can I tell things such as how many people do I have and what am I paying them? How much rent do I have and what am I paying it? What are my cash requirements and how am I offsetting those cash requirements, right? If I don't have tools that can tell me and track this from a cash perspective, then it's quite possible you're sub-optimizing your cash flow. And so what's key is, number one, that commitment to cash. And then number two, making sure that the tools that you're using, the metrics that you're assessing, the decisions that you're making are all driving towards generating cash. And when we do that, we're not looking at, oh, I lowered the cost per unit of a product. Because you know, if you think about it, okay, so I've got that person on the line, right? And we mentioned you know, $30 an hour. If they create more output, I'm still paying them $30 per hour. So from a cash perspective, it stays the same. From a cost per unit perspective, it goes down. 
So I get wrapped up in this cost per unit thing. And I think, oh, well, I'm generating cash because I'm improving my margins, blah, blah, blah. And it's a fictitious number created improperly. What we should be focusing on is how much did I spend? What did I create? And how much demand is it for what I created? So I can adjust how much I'm spending, right? If I didn't create as much output, I need to spend more potentially, or I need to increase the efficiency. But if I create a way too much output, maybe I have too much capacity and I can back off and save on cash. So those are the kind of things that I generate, uh, generally, generally shift companies towards. Focus on your, ca- your cash and your cash transactions. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to field um, emails um, from folks to help them understand where they should be focusing, uh, because I do that all the time. And I'm excited to help companies see things differently and help them move forward. What's the best way for them to get a hold of you? And also, do you want to give a little bit of a um, a plug for your books? Because I have read them and they are awesome and I highly, highly recommend them. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Rhonda Lynn. Um, the best way to reach me is uh, reginald.lee at bdrco.org. And let me spell that out as R-E-G-I-N-A-L-D dot L-E-E at B as in boy. D is in David, R, C is in cat, O, dot org. Either that or at the university, it's L-E-E-R-8 at Xavier, you know, uh, Xavier dot E-D-U. That's X-A-V-I-E-R dot E-D-U. Either one of those is fine. And, you know, thanks for the plugs in the books. The um, So the first, um, actually, I've got a couple of books that came out in the early 2000s. They've bas- basically been rewritten. So Lies, Damn Lies, and Cost Accounting is about helping us understand the limitations of cost and managerial accounting from a managerial decision-making perspective. So it helps deal with some of these problems that um, it, 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 it shows why these, these problems exist and what we can begin doing about it. So that's that book. Um, Strategic Cost Transformation creates a business framework that we can look at as business leaders to break up our organization into what we call operations and cash. That's Those are business activities, cash transactions. That's the meat of running a business, right? I can tell a lot by managing that data. And then I've got the accounting domain. And as you suggested, that's for reporting. So the idea behind that book is making sure that we understand we don't have to rely on the accounting reporting data. We can actually focus on the decisions that we're making that generate the results, right? If we can improve the, de- the decisions that we're making and how we do business, the results, as Peter Drucker said, will come on the, on the back end. So that book has done, a, I think, a decent job at helping us kind of understand that framework and how to look at our businesses differently and how to manage them. A um, couple of them that are coming out, engagement economics should be an interesting one uh, for companies that are services firms. So for example, your CPA firms out there, um, if you're dealing with any law firms, helping them understand how much cash in, uh, engagements are generating. And that's not always tied to things like my realization rate. It's not tied to the cost of the project. Then it breaks down cash and non-cash costs to help us understand how to both uh, pro- uh, price these products, um, projects and how to manage them and deliver them to generate both maximum cash profit and ma- maximum accounting profit. And then the other one, for some of your your uh, readers, it may be, I mean, some of your listeners, it may be interesting, and that is project profitability. And so when we do things, you know, if we're providers for services like Lean, Six Sigma, outsourcing, or even accounting services, right? Um, how do we make sure that the service that we're, services that we're providing are generating cash for the organizations. So it's not the, you make $100,000, I make you 10% more efficient, I saved you $10,000. No, 100,000 is still going out. This is how do I understand how my solution is going to change how much money they have to spend. So it gives us a different twist. So as you can see, with all my work, it's tied to cash. And if we can understand cash and have the tools to manage cash, then the accounting numbers on the back end will be a lot easier to generate. Yeah, look, they say cash is king, but... It's about measuring cash the correct way. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, look, you and I can probably talk for about four hours on this, and I definitely lo- love to have you on as a guest um, at another time again. But I just want to say thank you for coming. It was wonderful to speak to you. And I think all the listeners are going to go away with some really fantastic tips and strategies that they, they can implement right now today to fix their cash situation and make sure that they're bringing in and keeping in more than what is going out. Thank you for having me on. I'd be happy to come on again. And yes, we could talk about this stuff for hours. It's great stuff. Thank you so much. Well, with this much fun, it's hard to believe that we've already come to the end of this episode. I don't know about you, but I found this topic, our guest, and the specific strategies that were shared to be invaluable. 
I hope you managed to take lots of notes and you've made a list of all the powerful lessons that we discussed. The next step is to commit to implement at least one of the strategies that you've learned today. Remember, neuroscience has proven that it takes consistent effort for at least 60 consecutive days to instill a new habit. That's why consistency and persistence are vital to your success. If you want to learn more about financial foreplay, please check out ImagineeringNow.com and consider investing in your education by purchasing one of my books. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. And if you loved it, please leave a five-star review. Your feedback helps me to better understand if you're continuing to get phenomenal value from our guests and the strategies shared. By the way, I really like the direction this whole relationship is heading in. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Until we meet again, thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait to speak with you again soon.